Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jen Harris with the Los Angeles Times Food Section and thank you for joining our live chat right now with our restaurant critic, uh, Jonathan Gold, on his uh, 101 Best Restaurant list that just came out this weekend. Uh, Jonathan, how are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm great. Um, so the list, which is only available to our LA Times uh, members, just like I said, just came out this last weekend and we've already been getting a lot of feedback uh, on Twitter and Facebook. Um, if you have a question and you're watching live right now, you can tweet us at LA Times Food using the hashtag JGold101. Uh, so to start, uh, let's talk a little bit about how the list comes together. Um, do you organize it in a certain way? Um, and you know, how long did it take you to do this year's list? Uh, it always takes me a while to do the list. I mean, I have to start thinking about it almost the second that the um, last year's list comes out. Because I have, I go to every single restaurant on the list, at least within 14 months of this coming out, and that means usually a uh, busy month at the end where I'm eating, tasting menus, 14 days in a row, which is wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. That's quite a lot. <laughs> um, so, what are these all restaurants that you've reviewed, or how do you pick the restaurants? I haven't formally reviewed all of them, most of them I would think, but there are places that I go to that I think are either utterly exceptional or that I think represent what's happening in Los Angeles right now in a, in a sort of profound way. Okay, and so we have a couple of questions coming in uh, from Twitter. Um, let's see, so we have someone who wants to know, I've actually been wondering this too, uh, what happened to Urasawa, which ended up as number two on the list last year and has fallen off the list completely this year? I knew this was going to come off. I mean, it, it had to have. It was number two. It's a spectacular restaurant. The food is every bit as it was good as it was last year, one assumes. But it's so expensive. I mean... <laughs> No, no, really. You go to dinner there with somebody, and you have like a sort of a reasonable bottle bottle of sake, and you have the omakase, which is the mm -hmm. only way you can order. And with tax and tip, you're walking out with uh, you know a bill that's eleven hundred to thirteen hundred dollars. That's too much money for dinner, I think. Yeah. And I'm probably I think there are other places where maybe you could get a better experience for less money. I don't think I'm actually doing Times Readers a service to put it on. And maybe it'll be on next year. Maybe I'll have a meal that actually changes my mind about the place. And I'm certainly open to that. Okay, and really quickly before we continue, uh, Mr. Gold is in silhouette. Uh, he is our restaurant critic and we're trying to keep him anonymous, so that is why you are seeing the silhouette of Mr. Gold. Um, okay, so next question. I'm talking about how things moved around on the list this year. Also, uh, we had Kogi, the Kogi truck dropped from number 10 to, uh, uh, you know, farther down on the list. And also, but then you had Pot, one of his, one of Roy Choi's <coughs> restaurants, debut at 23. Talk to us a little bit about that. I thought the, the Kogi truck, in a way, that's a strange one, right? Because the Kogi truck, the food is the same as it was last year. Mm -hmm. The experience of the Kogi truck is the same. Last year, the phenomenon of the Kogi truck, the fact that it not only sort of launched the food truck revolution here, but in mm -hmm. cities all around the country, that there's a particular kind of... I hate to use the word fusion, but a way of putting together of cuisines that people are starting to do all over the world, and that Roy probably did first at Kogi, and though maybe this shouldn't count on this list, I think his use of social media is also something that transformed the world of restaurants. I mean, the Kogi truck was one of those few completely transformative restaurants. It's the sort of thing that only happens like once every 10 years. And in certain mm -hmm. ways, Kogi in 2013 was as important as, you know, Spago was in 1981. Now, taking a step back from it, maybe it becomes just a really good truck again. Mm -hmm. but, it's a re okay. but it's a really good truck. 
Yeah, I, I agree. It definitely is. Um, and so let's talk more about, because I mentioned Pot, Rory Choi's other restaurant that debuted at number 23. What are some of the most exciting restaurants, uh, new restaurants that made the list this year? Well, I mean, you know, Pot, of course, the, you know, what Roy is doing in looking at Korean food from a Korean-American perspective as somebody who grew up in and around Koreatown and is doing a Koreatown restaurant that is very much respectful of but also sort of thumbing its nose at a lot of traditions. It's, it's one of these things that works on like a million different levels. It almost be, might be like a Quentin, if Quentin Tarantino was a restaurateur this might be like something he'd come up with. Wow. Uh, okay. <laughs> Orson Winston's on the list this year, and I think that's mm -hmm. a, a fantastic new restaurant. Uh, Joseph Centeno, he's been somebody who's been cooking in L.A. for more than a decade, and I think he's finally found a place where he can put all of his disparate influences, his, um, you know, his love, love for the sushi kitchen, his Mexican-American background, uh, his interesting ideas of service, he's the one who invented the idea of sort of the endless tasting menu, you know, way back mm -hmm. when. And it, it, it's, it's a super exciting place to eat. Um, what, what are other new ones on the list? Uh, I think Republic. Republic is uh, sort of this me mega bistro that um, with Walter Mansky, who's been, I guess, primarily known as an haute cuisine chef at places like Patina and at Bastide, has opened like a, a mega bistro in the um, old Campanile space. And I will admit, the first couple of times I went there, I was sort of like grumbly at it because it wasn't the grand haute cuisine restaurant that I was sort of hoping for him, that it wasn't a grand artistic statement, but it turns out to be actually a fantastic place to eat. Uh, Barnyard is another one that's new to the list. The chef worked for a while at Tasting Kitchen, and it's this sort of really eccentric, almost aggressive approach to farm-to-table eating. That every time you go there, it takes you places that you hadn't thought you would actually go in a meal. Even if you're sitting in your main dish is a giant plate of crispy rice with some tomato on it. Mm -hmm. And you start eating it, and you're disappointed, and then you realize after three bites that this plate of uh, crispy rice is your god. And the, the and, and then you see the bottom of the plate, and it's just, it's stunning. It's, it's a place I hardly recommend. Okay. okay. Um, all right, we're getting a couple of questions in from Twitter right now. Uh, Brenda Urban wants to know, she's wondering why Bucato ranked mediocre when it's consistently a fave among media and industry folks, including your own review. Um, I wouldn't say that it's mediocre at all. If it's on this list, it's mm -hmm. really good. I mean, yeah. Los, Los Angeles is a phenomenal restaurant city, and I could, I could do a list of a thousand places that would all be really good places to eat. It wouldn't be a problem at all. Um, why did I rate Bucato uh, somewhat lower than, say, Bestia? Mm -hmm. um, I think perhaps Evan Funky's style of pasta making isn't particularly... I don't, I don't want to say my favorite, but it's a very specific style of pasta making. It's very untraditional in certain ways. And I think it's definitely making a statement, but I also think that sort of in the middle of the list is the right place for it. It's if you were going to put a place, plate of pasta from that restaurant up against a plate of, say, the, the fantastic handkerchief pasta from uh, Factory Kitchen, mm -hmm. I if you're dealing from an absolute qualitative how is the pasta made standpoint I think you definitely have to give the nod to some of maybe more, the more traditional places. Okay. 
Um, all right, let's see another question uh, from Twitter. Uh, Lori Mansfield is asking, can you please recommend some restaurants on the 101 list that are especially friendly to children? Uh, she has two kids, age two and five, and apparently they're adventurous eaters. Um, well, dim sum is always a great idea for mm -hmm. kids. I mean, sometimes you think, especially on a, on a busy Saturday morning, that if you don't have a uh, child with you, that one will be assigned to you at the door. And I, I think that Sea Harbor in Rosemead is just a splendid dim sum restaurant. Uh, kids like um, certain kinds of Mexican food a lot, and I think like Chich mm -hmm. Chichen Itza, which is in the La Paloma complex down near SC, is a great place for kids. They love it. There's all kinds of interesting fruit drinks to eat, and the interesting thing, or one of the good things about um, Yucatan cuisine is that it has a lot of you know interesting crispy and soft textures that kids tend to like and although it can be extremely spicy the spice is usually in sauces that you add at the end so it's easy to customize it for kids okay great um, all right and so we have a couple more questions about I, I know some people are are upset that maybe their favorite restaurants uh, didn't make it onto the list. So one of, one of the questions, um, Saul on Facebook wants to know, where is the Addiction Bistro on La Cienega on this list? Some of the greatest food you'll ever taste. I will admit my ignorance. I've never been to the Addiction Bistro. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, it, I, I know it's a, it's a place that has a, a couple, or they have more than a couple different types of chili on the menu that they make in-house. Um, all right, so another question. Uh, a couple of people we're disappointed that Josie Restaurant in Santa Monica didn't make the list. What are your thoughts on that? Josie was a really hard one. I mean, that was one of the last ones to make the cut. And I've, I've got to say that Josie Next Door, it's the gastropub attached to the restaurant. It's something, a place that I really, truly love. And sometimes, I don't know, sometimes they don't all make it. But okay. believe me, that was one that I felt. All right, and um, so, okay, someone else, Charlie on Facebook, says that he agrees about Providence. That's all that should be listed as best in LA. Everything else comes next. <laughs> so, so what do you what do you think is so special about Providence? It's it's um it was number one again. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Chimarusti has just matured so beautifully as a chef, and he has, you know, all the you know. O cuisine training you could wish. He trained with a lot of the best guys in France. He's, you know, solid on molecular gastronomy. And he'll sometimes use modernist approaches to his cooking that you don't always notice. Um, he's brilliant at sourcing seafood and super responsible in not having endangered or threatened seafood on his menu, which is hard. You know, you, if you're serving an expensive seafood menu, people sometimes want to see bluefin on it. And the responsible thing as a custodian of the uh, sea is, is somebody like who wants to keep the plan in a way that is going to be good won't serve bluefin, but it's hard to do it. And But his beyond that, his flavors are great. He's managed to synthesize a lot of the best elements of French cooking and Spanish mm -hmm. cooking, and especially, say, you know, Japanese cooking. He he um, incorporates a lot of foraged herbs into his food in interesting ways, especially if you go in the springtime and the the just the beauty of all those flowers on the plate is makes you almost not want to eat it. Yeah. Of course then, you, of course, you do. <laughs> then, of course, you do, and you're really happy you did. And there's this idea of Los Angeles as, yes, we are a region unto ourselves, and we are an agricultural region with certain things going on, but Los Angeles is also a great port city, one of the great port cities of the 21st century. And I think Providence, in its sort of cosmopolitan outlook to um, its menu, you know, put, represents that in a beautiful way, I think. Okay, and um, all right, we have Daniel F. Corridan on Facebook has a little bone to pick with you. Uh, he's saying that the Tasting Kitchen and AOC blow away Spago and Rustic Canyon, not even close. Um, I can see, I, I understand his point of view. 
Uh -huh. I don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, t like Tasting Kitchen is a much more aggressive approach to dining. It's much more minimal. It's I can see how it. Not not only can I see how it alienate people. I've I've taken people there who have been completely alienated by it. It's very chef centric. He's one of the big guys in the um, you know no no modifications movement, mm -hmm. which is still here. It hasn't gone anywhere. And Spago has just maintained its role as one of the greatest restaurants in the world. I think. Uh, I think that the especially the new AOC. In its space, uh, Suzanne Gowen has finally figured out how to, you know, incorporate the sort of wine bar, small plate, snacky thing that she pioneered at AOC. It was certainly the first restaurant in LA to do that, into a sort of wider, you know, pan Mediterranean French influenced menu. And in its way, it's it's as lovely as Luke, which is one of my favorite restaurants ever. But it's expressed in maybe a more informal way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and also from Twitter, uh, we have: Are there any new restaurants that open in 2014 that you would consider adding next year? Yeah, of course there are. There are new. There are new restaurants all the time. I probably shouldn't speculate as to what would be on okay. the <laughs> on next year's thing. Okay, they just dried on this list, <laughs> so we'll, we'll <laughs> let you take a take a breather for a little bit. Thank you. Um, okay. Also, uh, BF Foodie on Twitter wants to know what matters most after the food itself: uh, cocktail program, wines, location, atmosphere, cuisine. Well, I think about all of it. I mean, I love the number of restaurants in town that have. In you know maybe small but interesting wine programs where instead of going to the sort of big name California wines or going to the familiar French vintages and I guess we have to say familiar Italian vintages now um, they're going to different regions they're trying out some of the the smaller winemakers both in Northern California and in the Loire especially that are doing things with natural wines that they're seeking you know different interesting grapes from the um, you know the the north of Italy or the south of Italy mm -hmm. or Portugal or Slovenia or it's it can be as interesting to drink wine now as it can to be to eat food and you go to places like Providence and you could go to Providence and have just the steak free which is fantastic steak free by the way Sorry, I said Providence. I meant um, Republic, mm -hmm. and um, you, you can have the steak frites, which is a fantastic steak frit, and but you can have all the textural difference and the taste difference in your menu come from the wines rather than from the food, and I think that's kind of great to have that option. Definitely. Okay, and so um, okay, we have another question on Twitter. Uh, if there is any gluten friendly, gluten free friendly restaurants on the list that you know of, I think there are a lot of the restaurants are willing to do things to make their food gluten free. I mean, I, I think that even you know, looking at the top of the list, you know, Providence, Spago, Moza, Shunji, Luke. I mean, they're they can all whip up um, gluten free things. If you are truly, truly celiac, if you, if you are going to get some, uh, you know, major disease if you taste gluten, then it's much, much harder. But if you're just sort of gluten intolerant and you don't like the idea of gluten, mm -hmm. then I think a huge percentage of the restaurants on this list will be able to take you pretty far down that, in that direction. Okay. Uh, all right, and we have uh, Sean Granzow on Facebook is a lover and hater of the list, so to speak. Uh, she says, these lists always make me hungry, but they always disappoint me too. So many great unknown restaurants and so many overrated ones that made it on the list. Well, it's hard to... Um, the idea of a restaurant being overrated is sometimes funny, right? I mean, as, mm -hmm. I, as I'm the critic for the LA Times so 
if a restaurant is overrated, oftentimes it comes down to like it's a restaurant that I like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't I don't think there are overrated restaurants on this list. I think there are some restaurants that were overrated on maybe previous editions of the list that have been sort of trimmed that mm -hmm. maybe put forth a, uh, a, a style of cooking or a, a kind of service that I find perhaps a little bit old-fashioned. But I'm the last person on earth that you would want to ask about an overrated restaurant <laughs> in Los Angeles because yes. it's just, it's, it's a complete, con it's a paradox. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so uh, Wendy Trust on Facebook uh, pretty much sums up the truth about the 101 for Menu S, saying, this made me want to eat. Uh, of course, I'm sad that both of us don't have snacks right now in, in front of us, but when you were putting together the list, were you, I mean, I, I mean, if I were you, I would have just been snacking constantly while I was working. Um, well, I was, when I was working on it, sometimes I was going to a couple of restaurants a day. So yes. there, there, were, <laughs> there were parts where I never wanted to eat again. Oh, but, no. <laughs> But that, that's a, that's always that's always one of the both the delights and the and the uh, pitfalls of writing about food is you're always writing about things that are making you hungry and you can't actually go out for snacks because you've got to finish the piece, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. We have a question from Laura Silver uh, on Twitter asking, "Where are the best knishes in LA? And do you see or do you sense a renaissance coming?" Uh, the best knishes in LA are the ones, the tiny knish, potato knishes that sometimes come as part of the amuse bouche at Cut in Beverly Hills. Um, I'm not sure if you could probably demand them if they don't like show up. Tell them give you knishes because they're they're small <laughs> and they're they're perfectly crisp and they're creamy on the inside and they're with a really nice uh, on, oniony taste. They're delicious. Are knishes coming back as a thing? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, I think everybody's down down on carbs again, which means that knishes would be one of the first things that would go. But I went to the opening in New York last week of a restaurant, um, the Russ and Daughters Cafe, run by the family that has run the Russ and Daughters Appetizing Shop for a like 120 years, mm -hmm. and they had knishes, and those knishes were, you know, light and fluffy and crunchy and completely great. So if they catch on there as they could, maybe maybe the the great knish renaissance will start somewhere. Okay, and talk to us a little bit about uh, bite night, which is happening tonight and tomorrow. Bite night is always super fun. It's um, a selection of restaurants that are all on the 101. Um, I think there's between 20 and 25 a night. They're cooking in our printing plant on downtown. And it's an opportunity to taste food from some of the best restaurants and the best kitchens in Los Angeles. And one of the things I love so much about it is that you're not just hitting the super pricey places, you know, it's not all, you know, Pro Providence and Animal and Cut, though that would be great too, but you get to taste things from restaurants that may be in neighborhoods far from yours or may be serving kinds of traditional cuisine, like, you know, Ethiopian cuisine or uh, Mexico City style cuisine from a, you know, delicious restaurant in um, City of Commerce, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and the way that the chefs interact with each other is almost delicious as the food itself because if you're a chef of a quality sufficient to land you on the 101 list, you're, I mean, you're utterly obsessed with food. And mm -hmm. seeing some of those chefs taste things that they hadn't had before, is it's, it's fantastic. It's a great show. Okay, and one of our, our readers on Twitter previously asked if you're going to be in silhouette tonight and tomorrow night at bite night, as you are now. <laughs> No, I, I, I'm going to be wearing a burqa. So, <laughs> so, so, so if you see a... a, a, a 
Good. <laughs> That's good. So, but, okay. but, 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 you know, feel free to come up and say hi. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, all right, and Sal on Google Plus wants to know, uh, what about Peruvian food? Peruvian food is great, and there's some of the best restaurants in LA have Peruvian influences. Matsuhisa, for example, um, is ostensibly a Japanese restaurant, but uh, uh, Nobu Matsuhisa, the owner of it, got a lot of the ideas for it and for his Nobu Empire from uh, his years working as a sushi chef in Lima, and there's a lot of Peruvian influences there. Uh, Mochica, which is a wonderful a uh, Peruvian restaurant downtown is on the list, and I believe and Pika, which is a slightly more expensive, more sort of Japanese-based um, Peruvian restaurant on Pico near Beverly Hills is also on the list. And I could probably I probably could have found three more good Peruvian places to put on. This is sort of the the high point of Peruvian cuisine in Los Angeles. Nice. Okay, uh, and uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, if you have more thoughts for Jonathan Gold, uh, you can tweet at him at Big J Gold on Twitter. And um, thank you, Mr. Gold. We appreciate your time. Um, and if you'd like to check out the entire list, uh, the entire 101 list, again for our members, it's at latimes.com/gold101. Uh, this year you can do a brag list where you can tell people, you can make a list on our website about all the restaurants you've been to on the list already. You can also make a wish list for those that you want to go to. Um, and if you have more questions for Gold, you can actually ask him during another live chat happening Wednesday at noon on our blog, uh, latimes.com slash food slash daily dish.